Uh, thank you very much. I, I have to say, I, I'm delighted to be here. And I think the one thing that long bio, and that my head is well swollen at this stage, missed out, is more than anything, I'm a farmer. Okay. And uh, I'm a farmer on, on, on a journey. And I'm privileged to be here. Uh, my first proper engagement with Tesco, actually, I had the pleasure of hosting Natalie. Now, where's Natalie gone to? I had the pleasure of hosting Natalie on a research farm. I led for my previous employers, Devonish Nutrition, in just north of Dublin Airport two years ago. And Natalie saw the first iteration of this journey. So hopefully now you're going to see the second and third iteration. Uh, I also am, um, and I know that um, uh, Graham has now suddenly disappeared. Um, I also, for the last nine months, have been a special advisor to AHDB and also to Quality Meet Scotland. Uh, uh, my job I, there is a thought leader to try and help the levy bodies help you as levy payers on this journey. Uh, so I, I wear many ha hats. So the title I was asked to give was the journey to beyond net zero. And that's taking an assumption that such a thing is possible. Um, I'll let you judge uh, as such. So when we go on a journey like this, it's really important when we go on a journey like this that we understand what is being asked of us as farmers. Because today we'll talk about net zero. Tomorrow we'll talk about biodiversity. The next day we'll talk about water quality. And the following day, I'm in front of my bank manager justifying my budget for the next year. Okay? And it's really important that actually, when we as farmers look at our business and look at five years out and 10 years out, we actually define what it is that we're, we're doing and also calling it out. We deliver many public goods. And I make no apologies, and this builds on what Michael has already said, is first and foremost, what do we do? We produce highly nutritious meat and milk. First and foremost, uh, and, and plant-based products too. But that's what we do. But on top of that, there are a lot of other things we do. Um, without soil, we've got nothing. So delivering soil improvement, both fertility and health. We have carbon stocks. Our landscape is full of carbon stocks. So how do we start to do some heavy lifting? We have impacts on water quality. How does water leaving my land impact on the river and streams that go past me? And most importantly, we have a biodiversity crisis out there. And by the way, 60% of the world's biodiversity doesn't fly in the sky. It's under our feet. And we don't talk about that. So how do we get that? And ultimately, the biggest public good, and I will argue, and everyone says it's not a public good, is profit. Because when farm businesses make money, what do they do? They spend it. Okay? What is the fabric of the rural economy anywhere in the British Isles? The spending of the farming community and what it drives of Sillery Rudder. It is a public good. So, in everything I'm going to say, this is behind it. So, I'm now going to focus on the journey to net zero for a while. But I will come back to look at multiple public goods. Because when you keep this in your mind, the solutions that you pick for your business actually become different solutions. And uh, so you've seen various versions of this. I, I was late this morning. The reason I was late this morning is I was asked to give an interview to the Farmer's Guardian this morning, particularly around COP and what's going on at COP at the moment. And my frustrations is that everyone talks about net zero, okay? Everyone talks about net zero on the media and whatever else, and the second breath, they then talk about emissions, okay? It's really important to understand that net zero is not about zero emissions. Net zero is actually about bringing you, knowing your emissions and bringing them down, knowing your carbon stocks and building them up, displacing whatever fossil fuels you can displace, capturing waste, and particularly methane from waste. And when all of that activity gets to zero, that is net zero. It is not about zero emissions. Because remember, zero mean emissions mean no animals and no humans. That's what zero emissions mean. And that is not actually what people, so we, we really, so that has been our focus. So when I went on this journey, uh, as I say, when Natalie and I f first met, I worked for a company called Devonish, and I led their research farm. Since then, um, I decided to go on a journey with more farmers. 
So it's one thing to do it on one farm. Could you do it in more farms? And really, what we wanted to do is, how do we go towards net zero? And for me, key in this, measure and manage. Measure and manage, measure and manage. Because knowledge is power. And if you don't have knowledge, you cannot focus on what is the right decision for your business. Because what I know in farming, whatever's the right decision for me, sure as anything isn't the right decision for my neighbor next door. Because our factors are different. Their soils are different. Their enterprises are different. <coughs> in doing that, we need to know our numbers. So how do we do that? Well, we've got these things, life cycle assessment calculators. There's also awful acronym of LCA. Now, Michael did tempt me earlier on. I haven't got my one slide in, but if you're interested, go to the AHDB website. But how do you pick a calculator? Now, I have to declare first of all my conflict of interest because I'm a former director of SRUC, and I was the director who created the budget to create AgriCalc. I was the, correct, the director who appointed Julian Bell into AgriCalc and Bob Rees into the Carbon Management Center. So I am completely conflicted. <laughs> Saying that, I will ask you, if you, when you go to look at calculators, there's six questions I would ask you to ask of your calculator provider. The first one is, is it independent? This is really important, because the only reason you're doing a calculator is you want integrity in your journey, and you want your calculator to be independent. If someone is going to buy my carbon, and I have to use their calculator, I'm not going to sell my carbon to them. It's quite simple. The first thing, independent. The second thing, is it accredited? There is both an ISO and a British Standard Institute standard, past 2050, that clearly highlights the accreditation of the calculator. So is it accredited? The third thing is, does it look at the total business of yours rather than a product? Now, although the drive from the retail and processing side is about product footprint, I would say 99% of your farms produce more than one product. And it's one of the difficulties we have is the clash between a product footprint and a business footprint. Um, so first and foremost, you want to know your business footprint. And that's everything. And by the way, that's your unproductive land as well as your productive land, because you are a manager for that too, okay? It's everything. So does the calculator look at the totality of the business? Does it understand carbon segregation, carbon removals? Does it understand methane and GWP star? And ultimately, taking all of that in, is it supported by an internationally credible science-based organization? Because someone asked Michael a question, and Michael gave an honest answer. What will the calculators be like in five years' time? They will be different, because our knowledge is building every day. And it's really important that whatever calculator provider you go with is that they're backed by a science organization who will be con continuously mining the new knowledge and making that calculator better because our calculators are very crude at the moment, okay? So I hope, and all of those are actually on the AHDB website, if anyone's interested on AHDB's advice on how you pick a calculator. It's also important to understand their limitations. So when you go through a life cycle assessment calculator, they use a thing called a factor or an average. So a dairy cow is a dairy cow is a dairy cow. Well, you know and I know a dairy cow could produce 2,000 liters or 12,000 liters, okay? So actually, a dairy cow is not a dairy cow, is not a dairy cow. So when IPCC drew up this journey of calculators back in 1990, they started a thing called Tier 1, which just was an international fudge, a cow is a cow is a cow. They allowed us to, a, a journey of improvement. So Tier 2 is when you then make a judgment at a national level. And tier three is when you make a judgment at an actual farm business level. So it's about continuously improving. So when we look at emissions, the calculators out there that you are using should be using tier two emission factors. But where they're using carbon segregation at the moment, the data is not good for carbon segregation and they're only using tier one, okay? So you need to understand this. But the goal has to be that we all want to get to tier three. 
And that is the goal we want. And to get to tier three, we need data. And we need it from individual farms. That's where we need to get to. But the challenge, and if I specifically focus on carbon segregation, this is a paper published in June of this year by Wagenham University in Research, Professor Rachel Kramer, one of the world's top, one of the Europe's top soil scientists. It's a challenge using carbon prediction model, models. And modeling is a crude way of doing it. And I will come back and I'll explain a bit more about that. So Muggins here decided, okay, I've done it in one farm. Can I now do it in seven farms? Okay. So a week into COVID, Belfast being Belfast, came late, two years late with our EIP operational competitions. And we all became Zoom babies and seven of us came together. We put a bid in for a competition to secure 120,000 pounds to take seven farms and measure them. So ARC0 was born. ARC0 is an acronym. ARC is Accelerating Ruminant Carbon to Zero. That's its acronym. Here's the seven of us, my ugly mug up in the city of Derry. Uh, I'm odd in regards I grow willow energy crops and dry stock. Hugh, 180 dairy cows, him with his wife and his father. Patrick, really interesting landlord tenant. Uh, uh, Patrick's the, the landlord, beef and sheep. Roger and Hillary, well it's actually Hillary. Fantastic sheep producers, average lambing percentage for the last five years, 212% as an average sold. I mean, just extraordinary. Hillary, when you don't, what she doesn't know about sheep, you don't need to know. Um, Ian McClelland, another dairy farmer, new into dairy, only started milking nine years ago, which is quite unusual. Uh, Simon Best, very well-known rugby family. Anyone familiar with rugby? Simon's brother, Rory, was the famous all-black beater for Ireland. Uh, and then uh, John Egerton, down in Fermanagh, who does quite a lot of work with ABP and uh, has Blade Calf Enterprise as such. So a real cross-section, different enterprises, different climates, different soil types. And really what we want to see, how on earth could we pilot a journey to net zero across different enterprises? So where did we start? Well, the very first thing, and all of you, and I'm looking at the blank faces out here, all of you, we asked the same question. When we started this, we had a lot of blank faces too. It's what's our numbers? What's our numbers? We didn't know where our emissions were coming from, how much. We didn't know where our carbon stocks were, how much. So really what we wanted to do is we wanted the baseline and benchmark our businesses. So that's the first bit. This is about knowledge. This is about making us better farmers. Not being told, but us facing our own responsibility. So what do we do? Well, we measure emissions. We assume some segregation. We measure actual carbon stocks and soils and trees to get our net carbon position. Remember, net zero, not gross zero. Net carbon. We then, having educated ourselves with numbers, we then looked at what are the behavioral changes we were going to do, and could we do it in a way that would deliver other public goods at the same time? Okay, so that uh, very much is the journey. The image, I don't know if anyone's seen this piece of kit that was referred to earlier on. This is a green feed unit. This is actually on my own farm uh, where we were doing a crazy experiment feeding willow leaves to cattle. Um, so when you go through this, you get quite a long report. I'm not going to take you through the report, but I'm going to take you through the summary for the seven farms. So using AgriCalc's tier two emissions factor, what you can see there then is the gross emissions across the, uh, the seven farms. Doesn't mean much, it's a number. But actually then, when you start to work out your gross segregation, even with the caveat that this is only to tier one, um, when you put it together, this is where the table starts to be really quite interesting. So you've got your seven farms. You've got your enterprises. You've got their total emissions. You've got their total segregation. You've got their net position. And then the percentage reduction of the net against the gross. And what's really interesting when you do this is no two farms are the same. There are no silver bullets out there. You need to know your own numbers. No two farms are the same. Some farms will find this journey easier than others. Okay? 
And remember, the 2050 target is not about every single farmer getting to net zero. It is about the industry getting to zero. So what do I expect will happen if we're serious about this and we do some thought leadership around this, is the people who are really good at doing this journey, you should encourage them to do more. Because some won't get there. And then you create, just as we did with milk quotas, some kind of trading mechanism between ourselves, is that if someone wants to pay me a good price for milk, and milk is really important for human health, but I'm really struggling in some of the other sectors, you know, you can find a solution within the wider sector. So we need some entrepreneurial leadership in this to make this happen. What is also interesting, and nobody's talked about this yet, some farms are beyond net zero today. Now, mine's one of them, but it's an oddball. But actually, the interesting one is this one here. Beef and sheep production. Who would have thought that beef and sheep production, some of it would already be beyond net zero today? Because we're being told it's the red area. It's the bad area. Yet some farms are already there. And so this forensic measurement is really important if we're going to bring integrity and transparency to this journey. So the weakness in my story to date is the fact that we're only using tier one carbon sequestration. And I accept that criticism, okay? That's the weakness. So we built in Arc Zero a parallel program. Is if you can't measure, you can't manage. And in the last 10 years, technologies, digitalization of the landscape has just moved a million miles. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to tie in a technology I had learned about in my previous career in Devonish, about aerial LIDAR. Who has ever heard of LIDAR before? Okay, some. Right, there's some haven't. So let me explain what LIDAR is. So most of you will have heard of radar. So radar is where a machine throws out a radio beam and it bounces off something and it comes back, you capture it and you plot it. So planes have it, ships have it. LIDAR does exactly the same, but it uses laser beams, not radio beams. And the benefit when you do it over landscape is some of those beams may be intercepted. If you're flying over a, a tree, for example, some of that beam might hit the top of the tree and it'll bounce back quickly. Some of that beam will get through the whole way through and hit the soil and bounce back slower. And so you get this huge data set of return signals that you can then do funny things with, with fancy pieces of software and gives you really extraordinary information about how much carbon is in a tree, the topography of your landscape, where does surplus water leave your landscape and take nutrient and put it into the rivers. If you wanted to prevent flood risk management, where would be the best place to hold back water? LIDAR is stunning. The other piece of kit, and this is from a company uh, in Dundee. What is novel about them is they're the first company I know that can measure soil carbon down to the sea horizon or one meter deep. And for the first time, this is really interesting because when they do this, they give us the soil organic carbon percentage and bulk density at different layers in our soil. So not the 15 centimeters, 15 to 30, 30 to 60, 16 beyond. The reason this is really important, and I have to, like Michael, declare my prejudice, I'm closer to the livestock sector than the arable sector, so uh, sorry. But the big thing we're trying to do in Ireland is wean ourselves off our addiction to synthetic nitrogen. Because like Michael, I actually believe that nitrous oxide is the bogey, not methane. Okay? And we have a big problem in Ireland, is we're addicted to synthetic nitrogen and a monoculture of perennial ryegrass. And we grow a lot of white water, and we produce a lot of beef and lamb off that. Okay, But as you move from that and you start to get your soil pH right, you start to put legumes in, you start to put herbs in, what happens? Those legumes and the herbs lay more carbon down and deeper. So it's really important when you go to measurements, is the measurements are sophisticated enough that if you change your behavior, you actually get it picked up. Because at the moment, it doesn't. Okay, So the great thing about this piece of kit over here is if I go from my monoculture of perennial ryegrass to my herbs and legumes, I have deeper carbon and more of it, agri-carbon pick it up. If I repeat both of these every five years, I measure change. Because the one thing we need to be very clear is your carbon and my carbon is never permanent. 
And if you t listen to COP, everything's about permanency. Well, that's right for fossil fuels. But if you're talking about biogenic methane, you're talking about biology carbon, it is never permanent. So you need a different tool to measure our journey. So we believe measure, manage, measure, manage, measure, manage. Expect to redo this every five years. Then you can see the train has left the station, which direction it's going, and at what speed. So how do things look? So this is my own farm. This image is a software portrayal of the trees on my landscape. So all these funny colors are all heights. And on my farm, unusually, I have 250-year-old trees, oak trees. I have 30-year-old oak trees. I have 110-year-old silver pasture. I've got my willow energy crops. And I've got my grazing ground. OK? But the great thing about this technology is when you visualize this, you can then do this. This is my carbon asset register for my farm. So I've now singled out digitally all my different hedges of different heights, my single trees, my deciduous trees, my coniferous trees, my biomass short rotation willow. So I've looked at my lengths and I've looked at my above ground carbon and my total carbon. And then we have used one uh, uh, algorithm, which we, we've pinched from IPCC, is how do we work out the below ground carbon? Because the LIDAR can't tell you what's below the ground, okay? And so on my farm, I have 1,349 tons of carbon in my trees. And I hope when I do it again in five years' time, I might have 1,600 tons, okay? So just like on the emissions, I can now set targets. On soils, what we did in soils is we brought agri-carbon in, but we stratified our land into different land uses and different land managements. And we also did the land that currently is uneconomically productive. It's still part of your farm business. And actually, it's a really good control on soil health, just seeing what is that like without any human intervention, OK? And so we stratified that. We worked out not only our pH and our soil organic matter, but our carbon stocks. And what you can see in my soil, I have just under 5,320 tons. And then you have to convert that to the currency, because carbon isn't our currency. Carbon dioxide equivalence is the currency. So you convert that across. And if I then added on my work from my trees, I have got 24,400 ton of carbon on my trees. And so it's. Now, the really interesting thing about this, I now know my numbers. And my plan is to redo that every five years. But also, too, in my work, I do many public meetings. And I meet many concerned citizens who lambast me for supporting livestock agriculture. And I just say, well, hold on a moment. I hear the aggression in your voice, but can I pause you a moment, please? Can I ask you one simple question? How much carbon do you have a responsibility for every year? And there's a silence, because they don't know. They ask, I ask, you know, they say, what do you mean? So I said, how much carbon do you have a responsibility for? I don't know. I said, well, can I just say two things? One is, I actually think you should know, because if you're serious about your journey, you need to know your numbers. And actually, I do know mine. And on my farm, I have to manage 24,400 tons of carbon before I can produce an ounce of food for you to eat. And if I do it properly, hopefully when I repeat this in 25 years, in five years' time, I will have 26,000 tons. So actually, I and my peers are the custodians of much of the nation's carbon stocks. And actually, I actually think you need me more than I need you. Now, you know something, I'm not being it to be facetious, but I'm, I'm there to make a point. And the point is, actually, you need to respect farmers, farmers and land managers. They are part of the solution and not just the problem. And it's really, this gives data for the first time, and it arms us on our journey. So what does it look like on seven farms? What we didn't expect when we went on this journey to find seven farms in Northern Ireland have responsibility for over half a million tonne of carbon stocks every year. Never knew that. Totally news to us, but now we do know it. And the trick on this, uh, are two things. First of all, interesting, because of the way we've done it, we can separate how much carbon is in our soil and how much carbon is in our trees. And with all the passion to go to trees, and bearing in mind, 
most of my farm is already in trees, so there's my farm there. 80% of my carbon is still in the soil. Over the seven farms, 97% of that carbon is in the soil. So if we are serious about delivering net zero and getting our emissions down and building carbon soil, we have to get soil health right. But we also have to do it in a way that we can build targets to build our carbon stocks, but in a manner that when, whether it be Arla or ABP are doing their scope three emission declaration for Tesco's, is it's caught. Because currently it's not caught. The clue is in its title, scope three emission declaration, not scope three net declaration, okay? Neither can it help DEFRA when it answers the greenhouse gas national inventory every year. There is no mechanism at the moment to pick this improvement and stick it in here. So that is one of my roles in AHDB, is that policy science practitioner interface is how do we now make this a joint up process where my behavior reports simultaneously to both and it gets counted. If it gets counted, I can get rewarded, okay? So that's where I'm going. So we now have this knowledge, all seven of us now know our numbers. So our key thing is, well, what the hell do we do? Okay, we know our numbers, what do we do? The key thing in this is we're business people. So whatever we do, it has to be so I can look my bank manager square in the face and say I've done the right thing, okay, economically. So there is actually an economic tool out there. Um, this is an old one, but I use it for an illustration. There's a thing called a marginal abatement cost curve. In other words, every activity you do in your farm, someone has already put some kind of economic cost against it. So on this, in each one of these bars, it's an activity. So this one here, timing of organic nitrogen, manure nitrogen use, uh, breeding, okay, uh, improved drainage. So there's a lot of different activities. This is an old one, but it's nice and colorful, so I use it as a... But what is interesting here is if you look at the y-axis, this is about cost. But what's interesting is the x-axis cuts the y-axis halfway up. So this is positive cost, this is a negative cost. What's a negative cost? It's a profit. And what's really interesting when you do this is there's a heap of things going back to Phil's comment earlier on. Phil says, actually, before we go to the sexy things, could we do these things first? These will deliver for your business, but will also deliver for concerned citizens, ABP, Arla, and Tesco's. The win-wins. Okay. Over here, the win loses. Now, someone asked the question about methane inhibitors. Where do methane inhibitors sit on this curve? They sit in the win lose. Yes, they will reduce the footprint, but there's a cost. And unless someone's going to pay you on that cost, um, so. Really, we need to be very careful. Another example of a win-lose is blue and green nitrogen. We know one of the big global players will be bringing both blue and green nitrogen to the marketplace. It will reduce our footprint, but it's a win-lose at the moment. And until someone answers how farmers are going to answer this, I can only encourage farmers to sit in here for the moment, okay? So anything that AACB will be advising you is about the win-wins. We will talk about the win-losers. We'll talk about the costs associated, but we will also be flagging up. We need to find a mechanism to allow people to be rewarded in that. So from the seven of us, what did we do? Well, I make absolutely no apologies. This is what we focused on, improving efficiency, okay? What did that mean to us? Genetics, what was on Michael's list? Genetics, okay? Improving genetics. For beef and lamb, age of slaughter, okay? And I know that's a pushback because there was a question about a lighter animal in there. Um, age of slaughter makes a big difference. Cow size, actually, whether it be a dairy cow or a beef cow, a big animal consumes more food, produces more greenhouse gases, and you only get one cow from it a year. So animal size, animal health, real issue around animal health, and I'll come and talk about it again in a moment. In a case of soils, the very first thing, all farms mandatory should do their soil pH every two years. 
just uh, unbelievable, how, particularly under grazing animals, how poor our soil pH is. Really important for, for e efficiency of nutrient uptake. But also, as we switch to a legume-based agriculture, legumes on a mineral soil like a pH 6.5. I constantly have a spat back in Northern Ireland. I'm having an AHDB as well, because RB209 says that the optimal pH for grass is 6. If you, just take my word for it, if you want success in legumes, get your mineral soils up to 6.5. Do not stay at 6. Um, because the key thing we're wanting is to reduce nitrogen fertilizer. I'm in Michael's camp here. For me, nitrous oxide is the bogey. Not methane. Nitrous oxide is the bogey. We have looked at planting trees, hedgerow management. Then there was a crazy guy who grazed his willow trees. Okay? Now, uh, here's a few sniggers. Okay? You know what my results were? I had my green feed unit. I did it with Queen's University. I did it with AFPI. did it with Credible Sciences Partners. We reduced our methane per kilo of live weight gain by 28% by adding willow leaves into that feed. And the great thing about my willow trees is they grow naturally. And you know something, every time you eat them down, they keep coming back. You know? So actually, this journey will push us out of our comfort zone. What I really would like to try is put willows and multi-species together in a silver pasture. Someone said silver <laughs> pasture. And, okay? You know? So there are some funky things out there that we could still do in grazing systems. Did we get behavioral change? The answer is yes. So we put our guys through agri-calc twice. We particularly focus on the ones that weren't already beyond net zero. And you can see there, all the farms achieved the behavioral change, some more than others. There were some determining factors. What really helped in this journey is the price of nitrogen fertilizer in the Ukraine war went to 1,000 pounds a tonne. It wasn't hard to persuade someone to reach for a bag of legume seed. Okay, so that helped. Timing of sowing of legumes, because if we had done it, in if I was doing this again, I would not do agri-calc every year. It's quite onerous, I have to say. It puts a lot of day. I would be looking to do it after the third, you know, first year, then go skip three years, do it again, and then do it every two years after that. Because when you do it, and we paid our extra money, and we got SAC Consulting to help us, we wanted to make sure we put the right information into the calculator, but we wanted some quality analysis out of the calculator to help us on behavioral change, okay? And that's what we did. And Hugh here, alas, had one bad livestock health outbreak, okay? And it's extraordinary. Hugh did some fantastic work in reducing nitrous oxide emissions, but it was screwed by ill health of the animals. So that interrelationship, really important. You have to look at the total business. So up until now, I have done everything by the book, okay? Michael put this slide up earlier on. The reason I'm putting it up, and you will see AHDB making a big noise about this, is to support Michael and his fellow scientists. Because the one thing Professor Miles Allen has said at Oxford for the last five years, methane is not a long-lived gas. Methane is a short-lived gas. Currently, the methodology we use says methane this for 100 years. It doesn't. So, Mike, uh, 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 um, Miles has been saying this for five years. IPCC now recognize that they're not counting it correctly. They have a review. So, Michael and his cohort came together, reviewed the science, and published this, clearly highlighting that GWP star was a more appropriate, but recognized the IPCC process. So, in the meantime, we should answer, we should actually report against both uh, uh, as such. On top of that, since Michael's report, this came out in September time from the FAO. Remember, the FAO is an agency of the United Nations. It specifically looks at methane emissions of livestock and rice. But I've highlighted, it's a, it's a good 150-page report if you want some nighttime reading. Um, but what it has highlighted is, first of all, it recognizes methane is different. It is a short-lived gas. It's really helpful when a UN document says that. The second thing is whether you believe or don't believe in GWP star, what it does say is biogenic methane is different to fossil fuel methane if you use G GWP 100. And at the moment, a lot of calculators aren't making that difference. Okay? 
The third thing is it does actually recognize GWP star. It talks at quite length about GWP star and other metrics. And its last recommendation is, is considering the recent guidance, you should you report against multiple metrics in a life cycle assessment calculator. So I had the privilege, um, uh, Michael wearing one of his many hats, invited me to speak at the European Animal Science Association's annual conference in Lyon in August time. So taking the output, we went back to AgriCalc and we did some heavy number crunching. So what we wanted to do is see how did reporting GWP star impact on the seven Arc Zero farms. So we're bringing it right down. And so you can see the, the seven farms, the enterprises. This was the reduction I was showing with the two dairy farms of 28 to 29% or 28, 27% when bringing carbon sequestration. But look what GWP star does. So the two dairy farms, go from somewhere around 27 to somewhere around 49%. In the case of John's beef and lamb, 30% to 63%. Um, on Roger's sheep and beef, they've now gone to beyond net zero. So we've now got a third farm beyond net zero. In the case of Simon's farm on arable, didn't make a great pile of difference. Why? because actually arable doesn't have much biogenic methane associated with it. Okay, so that flagged that up. And Patrick, myself, far. So key in that is also knowing the national herd size over the last 20 years and its trajectory. It helps in the UK that over the last 20 years, our overall numbers have reduced, and that helps with the GWP star metric. So from AHDB's point of view from Arc Zero, we now comply with the latest science guidelines which is we are now declaring our journey on both methodologies. When you add in carbon sequestration and you add in GWP star, suddenly the current narrative that everything animal is bad and everything plant is good suddenly changes. And I will argue, or urge, which bit of the science do people not, you know, not agree with? This is about using science properly. So I said right at the start, at the end of the day, I, as a farmer, cannot just be single-minded about the journey to net zero. The beauty about the journey we have gone on is the same technology using different software can give you interesting results. This image, anyone idea what this image is? The clue is in its title, by the way. But anyway. This is a runoff risk map. Why is that important? Well, if you go and ask many concerned citizens in the UK at the moment, what's one of the biggest things they're worried about? is water quality, okay? Now, we're farmers are quite lucky that a lot of the flack is put at the private sector water companies. You know something, we have a footprint in it too. The great thing about LIDAR, and because we've done precision soil sampling and analysis as well, is we can layer it. So these yellow and red marks are our roots of overland flow in extreme rainfall. So where does soil, nutrient, pesticides leave our land and discharge into the water course. So all these blue lines are the water course. And what's really interesting when you do this, what you find is that there are two or three real key points. But if I had done what is best practice, which is a, a repairing strip the whole way along, is 80% of that repairing strip would be in the wrong place. So this now means if we're going to do a landscape intervention, it's science-based. You're putting it in the right place and you're designing it to understand the overall catchment that drains through it. Really putting science at the front. And what's really interesting, so this is Hugh Harperson's dairy farm. I have to say this is his worst field. He's got some fields that have no yellow or red on it at all. But I did it for a reason, because Hugh had just gone through agriculture. He had just been told that he was addicted to synthetic nitrogen. And he had just been shown how big the nitrous oxide footprint was on his greenhouse gas emissions. And so we were flirting with him because you, typical dairy farm in Ireland, monoculture perennial ryegrass and as much synthetic nitrogen as he could get away with. Okay? What did Hugh do? Hugh reached for this. This is chicory, alongside red and white clover, alongside plantain. And he chose on his own volition, is he said, John, if I do my first exploration of multi species wards, if I did it on top of my roots of overland flow, would that not be the right answer? 
Why? Going back to something Michael showed, porosity. What do these plants do is they have far deeper roots than grass. They open up the soil. We know from the work in Ibers that if you put red clover in, water will penetrate up to 16 times faster. So actually, he hasn't taken any land out of production, but what he's done is he's focused his multi-species swords in the areas of high risk. By doing that, he's improved his water quality. We've seen a 300-fold increase in earthworm population. He's displaced nitrogen fertilizer, and he's building carbon stocks. So he made one behavioral change, and he delivered five public goods at the same time. That's why it's really important that when we go on this journey, we look at the multiple public goods journey. On my own farm, my farm, as I already highlighted, is peculiar. It has these five historic land uses. The reason I put this up here is I am told every time I engage with policy, get rid of animals, plant trees. Get rid of animals, plant trees. Okay, that's what I'm told. So I said I asked the same question I've always asked of science-based evidence making. Are there any perverse consequences of this journey? No. I said, show me the published data. Oh, we don't have the published data. I said, OK. Now, it just so happened, this is my, I live two miles from the center of the city of Derry. That's the river foil in the background. I've got my short rotation willow crop. I've got my 30-year-old oak trees I planted when I first came home. My great-grandfather planted my silver pasture. My great-great-great-grandfather planted my 250-year-old uh, oak trees. And then we've got our permanent pasture. What we did this year, as part of Arc Zero, is we reached to Wagram University Research, another good university, and we got a master's student called Ricardo Bavara, who spent four months analyzing the difference on soil carbon and soil biology of those different land uses. Because I hadn't seen any published data. And what's really interesting, because I want to really labor this, this is a publication for the National Academy of Science. Soil is estimated to be the home for 90% of the world's fungi, 85% of the plants, and more than 50% of the bacteria. Soil, not trees and hedges, soil, okay? So we did earthworm population. Woodlands, woodlands, grass, silver pasture, willows. You can see there's a real winner there. When we went and looked at bacterial fungi communities, okay, again, Woodland, woodland, grass, silver pasture, willow. What's the commonality in here? The commonality is the land that big animals defecate on are absolutely driving my soil biology. Now, health warning, this is one farm. I want to do it in 200 farms, okay? To see, is that replicated? <laughs> because if it is, this is the story that actually we need to tie into as well is that cycler, circular nature. When we went and looked at soil organic carbon, it's really important when you do this that you do something first. You look at what we call a, a soil texture classification. So what do I mean by that? Well, how much of my soil is clay? How much of my soil is silt? How much of my soil is sand? The reason this is important is clay will hold more carbon than silt, and silt will hold more carbon than sand. And what we find on my farm, Quite unusually is we were quite representative. We, you know, there wasn't a huge di diversity. Because really where we wanted to go to is we brought agri-carbon in with this big piece of kit down to a meter, and we measured soil organic carbon stocks. Because really what we want to be able to deduce is if the soil is the same regardless of land use, if different land uses are producing more carbon, we would find it. Well, we did. There was a clear winner silver pasture, but there were clear losers. One, two, three. And the only conclusion we could come out of is anything that is a monoculture, whether it be a monoculture of grass or a monoculture, in this case, it wasn't Sitka spruce, it was oak, daddy of the trees. Our soil biology has collapsed. Our soil organic carbon has collapsed with it. Now, it's only one farm. Our belief about this, we're gobsmacked about this, what we think is the consequence is when my great-great-great-grandfather planted it, what did he do? He fenced big animals out of it. Why is that important? Because if you plant a soil of healthy microbiome, 
It relies on that inoculant every year coming from feces to keep it going. It will maintain its own pH. But when you get rid of those feces, the microbiome slows down. When it slows down, it is not able to keep that pH stable. If I then showed you our soil pH maps, under my oak trees, my soil has dropped to pH 4.8, while my productive land is sitting at 6.5. So these are some really strong messages that actually, whatever land use you end up doing, because it'll be a mixture, the land management is actually more important than the land use, regardless of it. So what we want to do is we want to take this and leverage it into public policy. Uh, Simon, in his introduction, mentioned that for seven years I chaired Northern Ireland's expert working group on sustainable land management. And we took the learnings from Devonshire's work on Douth and the learnings of ARP0, and we said to government, if you can't measure, you can't manage. We need one single framework. One single framework. And uh, off we went. We secured 38 million with a top up to 45 million if the scheme was oversubscribed. Divided Northern Ireland in four, one zone per year. And what's really interesting is last year when it was open, 92% of farmers applied. This year, another 92% of farmers applied. Farmers like knowing their numbers. Really helpful. But most importantly, and this is my message I also say now in Cardiff, London, and Edinburgh, Government recognition, measuring, reporting, and verification is a public good. This is expensive to do, but let's put it into context. This is roughly 3% of the total annual subvention to farms in the UK. That's its cost. But the knowledge it generates, the integrity it generates, and the confidence it can give our processors and retailers when it's repeated every five years, is this answers so much of the questions that's mentioned. And it gets us away from modeling and gives us actual data and make sure that as you go on your journey, you get it counted and you get it recognized. The reason this is important is ever since Brexit, I believe we in the UK have been blindfolded. We don't look outside the United Kingdom. So I'm going to flag up two issues that are going on. First of all, Australia. What country did our government do a free trade deal with? Australia. Why is it important in this conversation? In 2014, the federal government of Australia saw the opportunity of carbon removals in the land-based sector. But they wanted it of integrity. They didn't like the Wild West of the private sector. So they created a regulatory framework. It's called the Clean Air Regulator. But they set the bar really high. And up until this year, not one farm had got through. This year, seven farms have got through. And what is really interesting, this is Archer Farm was the first farm to get approved. They measured soil organic carbon down to a meter deep, and they measured it seven years apart, and then they took all the data to the clean air regulator. What he did get is he got these Australian carbon credit units, these ACCUs, when he took it to the private sector market, the private sector market was at $40 a tonne. He got $93 a tonne. It was a premium, and it was a premium because of the integrity of the journey. Measurement is your friend. Measurement is your friend. And bring it closer to home, and I farm two miles from the Irish border. 21st of the 11th, 23rd, really important date. The Irish European, sorry, the European Parliament's plenary voted to adopt a certification framework for carbon removals from the land based sector. We compete against 27 member states. One of them lives two miles from where I live. And we're now going to be in a situation that my peers two miles away will be able to get recognized for their carbon sequestration. And we have nothing. We don't even have a conversation. So regardless of what people are saying and what's going on in COP, this is about economics now. If we don't crack this, we are now unproductive, uneconomically productive, because they have a, now a new mechanism. 
What I didn't show, the seventh Australian farmer created 94,400 carbon credit units, which he sold for $93 a ton. He went home with a check for seven years carbon sequestration of $8.8 .8 million. So I'm doing this on purpose because this journey is moving at a real rate of knots. Michael made a comment about me. I am passionate. If you cannot measure, you cannot manage. If you're starting your journey, you need to start it soon. These are the issues I am raising on your behalf in AHDB. Is the definition of net zero and its interpretation. The national targets, the disconnect between national targets and scope three emissions to my business. There's just no connection at the moment. We need to connect it. Baselining my carbon stocks and my emissions, knowing my numbers. Not for everybody else to know my numbers, but I need to know my own numbers. This is about empowering me to make better decisions about my business. Averaging within these life cycle sets and calculators really penalizes the innovative and the early adopters. We need to get to tier three as soon as possible. And we need the science community to go on a journey with us on that. It's really important when we make this journey that our changes are captured. So that when Tesco's team are actually telling the story, they can tell it with integrity. They can hold their heads up high on our behalf. Likewise, when the UK government declares every year the greenhouse gas national inventory and its reduction, they can tell it with integrity and our behavioral change has picked up. It is really important that the national inventory recognizes that I just don't do one activity and I belch a methane. I build carbon stocks. So I, and currently the national inventory is a set of vertical silos that don't talk to each other. So we need insets within the farm business. And lastly, we need to do in a way that delivers multiple public goods at the same time. This is not just a journey about carbon. It's a journey about biodiversity, water quality, human health, and we need to do it all together. So I hope in that little spin round is that I have actually shown you that actually beyond net zero is achievable. I hope I've done it in a way that I'm empowering you to actually get out there and know your own numbers. Okay? At the end of the day, delivering net zero on multiple public goods simultaneously is actually what we need as businesses, but it's what society needs too. And I have to say, James talked about being a father. Well, I'm a grandfather of four, okay? So I have even a better reason to get out of my bed. You know, it is incumbent in us to take ownership of this journey. What we've tried to do as seven farmers is hold our heads up high and have a go at it but be transparent, do it with integrity. And the reason I'm here today is one, we want to help others, we want to share our journey, and we would love to see something similar across Great Britain and just not in Northern Ireland. You know, the Arc Zero model, but also Cardiff, London, and Edinburgh saying, measuring reporting and verification on a whole landscape scale is a public good, and they need to step up to the plate too. We can't do it on our own. Thank you very much.